Professor Friends holds the prestigious title of Cavendish Professor. He is a world leader and, in, and a pioneer in the field of organic semiconductors and nanostructures. His group at Cavendish pioneered numerous ideas and was the first to demonstrate essentially every important device based on or organic semiconductors. This includes things like the org first organic transistor, the first LED, the first integrated circuit, and the first organic uh, material laser. We at Technion are fortunate to have two faculty members who spent their postdoc period with Professor Friend. They then returned to Technion uh, during the period year 2000 to 2002, and both have established world-class activities. Uh, they brought with them what they learned uh, at Cavendish, and they brought us to the forefront of research in this exciting field of organic semiconductors and semiconductor nanostructure devices. So we are very pleased and very honored to have Professor Friend, and I call about Richard Friend to present the first talk of the symposium. Thank you for those very generous remarks. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here on this special day. Um, I would remark that this wonderful new building that was open today is the sort of visible sign of both you know, the external support, which is so important for universities um, in, in the current age, but also the vitality of the internal activities, uh, the vision and the, um, the, 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 the desire to do good science um, has to come first, um, otherwise um, smart benefactors don't respond. And I, uh, uh, brick, bricks and mortar are uh, one thing, but behind that there is um, a wonderful program of science and engineering here. I want to give you a talk um, which I've called Plastic Electronics, uh, which I hope will be a tour through um, both the science and engineering of what we can do with materials which have traditionally not been regarded as part of um, semiconductors, and those are polymers which, will be, which have semiconducting properties. It's perhaps an interesting question as to whether this is nanotechnology. I will try and convince you that it is. Um, for me, nanotechnology is the bringing together of different areas of science and engineering to be able to um, exploit functionality which we can define uh, within a molecule or within a polymer chain by clever processing to put it into a structure which will do something uh, we find um, productive. So to make electronics work with plastics uh, or polymers, uh, we have to do two things. First of all, we have to demonstrate that we can find molecules or polymer chains which will show the right sorts of um, semiconducting properties. And um, I wouldn't be standing here if we couldn't do that. Um, and uh, one can get plenty of inspiration from nature. Of course, photosynthesis is far and away the most successful semiconductor device about. It's very good at taking photons to create excitations in molecules, split charge. It then goes off and does chemistry, um, but it's a sort of semiconductor device. Those sorts of molecules we can use, uh, as say, extended as polymer chains and use them in our traditional sorts of devices. The second issue is that what really makes this field interesting is the scope for new ways of making structures. That whereas the world of silicon and gallium arsenide um, is a world in which the process medium is a high vacuum um, and the process temperature is high and um, there are all sorts of benefits but many constraints that come from that, uh, nature chose to do most of its processing at around room temperature uh, and chooses to use liquids as the transport medium um, the question is, can we do the same? Can we take advantage of the ability to get some elements of self-organization so that we can create small structures when we want to uh, without needing to use brute force? And I'll give you an example, if I don't run out of time, um, on how we can make use of differentiation between hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions to define very small channels. So if I can start with, in a sense, where the, the field first got um, exciting, and that is with uh, light-emitting diodes. And uh, I'll show you some molecules, I hope not too many. Uh, this thing here, uh, PPV, polyparaphenylene vinylene, is the fruit fly of the field of light-emitting diodes with, with polymers. Uh, its chemical structure is a six-membered ring, a benzene, and then a 
carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, and that is then the repeat motif that makes the polymer chain. Why it's semiconducting is because of the um, PZ electrons, the pi electrons, which are represented by this alternation of double and single carbon-carbon bonding along the chain. Those, the, this, the electron in the second bond and the double bond is relatively free to delocalize and uh, carry charge or energy um, up and down the polymer chain. Now, if you have polymers and you've made them right, and there's a huge amount of chemistry which I'll give scant um, attention to because uh, this is a sort of physics uh, engineering oriented talk, uh, if you have them, you would usually have them in solution and you'd look at them as little bottles of um, actually rather expensive uh, research materials and they're highly colored. Under ordinary light, they are strongly fluorescent. They're absorbing UV and blue, re-emitting red, green, yellow, or the colors that you see here. And the reason for that is that they're absorbing, they're exciting the pi electron system, exciting across uh, from filled pi to empty pi star. That is then creating a bound state, a molecular excitation, which you can call an electron in a hole if you want to, but it isn't really a free electron in a hole. It's quite strongly bound, and it's re-radiating. So these are materials where, once you've got an excitation, they naturally want to radiate. So the challenge is, can we get the same excitation, the same um, radiation, not by photo-exciting, but by electrical excitation? And that's something which turns out to be um, much easier than one might have expected. This is a, a cartoon going back a few years. For, uh, we published a paper in 1990 showing how it's possible to make the simplest possible semiconductor device, which is a sandwich of semiconductor, that's the green slab, between two metals. The one on the bottom uh, here is a transparent metal, indium tin oxide, pre-coated on a glass substrate. We've then literally painted down a film of polymer from solution, and then we've evaporated a top electrode on, which is usually a low work function metal such as calcium. What we do is inject an electron from the top electrode uh, and put that into a pi star state, pull an electron out of the low-lying pi state, and as the electron from the pi star state drops down to the pi, that's the radiation, that's the same excitation, de-excitation, uh, as we would have achieved following um, uh, optical excitation and the fluorescent paint um, concept. So why these are potentially important is that we can make them wherever we want. We're not constrained to making small devices closely packed together on a wafer of silicon or a wafer of a 3.5 semiconductor. We can literally paint or print. And the concept that has had a lot of um, um, impact in the industry is that we could actually use direct printing, inkjet printing, as a means of patterning. And of course, we know that inkjet printing produces sub $100 um, photographic quality home printers. We know that it has the spatial resolution to produce that quality of image. What we have to do now is generalize the concept of ink from stuff that leaves marks on pieces of paper uh, to functional materials. So ink now means semiconductor. Uh, what we have done is to formulate soluble polymers, uh, different polymers that will emit red, green, or blue, depending on their com chemical composition, and arrange that we can print them using the same print heads that one would have in a home printer. So on the left is an image actually of an Epson print head. We've worked a lot with Epson. On the right is a blown up image. Uh, the uh, repeat distance here is about one third of a millimeter of green, red, and blue subpixels, which have been obtained by printing the polymer, which is then being electrically excited in the light emitting diode. And in, in principle, that is a very cheap way of making a functional device. It's one pass with a three color printer puts in the full patterning required to make a full color display. And in the trade shows, there are some really good demonstrators now of what can be done. They're very efficient. The quality of the image is spectacular. Some of them are large. The largest that's been shown, 40 inch, so that's just over a meter diagonal, inkjet printed polymer light emitting um, diode display. The, uh,
pull through into the marketplace depends on factors that go beyond the immediate science and engineering. A lot of it actually has to do with the backplane silicon transistor technology, where it's looking all right, but it keeps, you no, know, it hasn't made the mass markets yet. It's in a number of uh, niche products at the moment. Back to some of the science, and um, of course, when one th I mentioned photosynthesis uh, at the start of my talk, and photosynthesis is the process of sunlight being absorbed um, and creating separated charges. And at the face, on the face of it, that's a relatively difficult process to make happen with a molecular material because the molecular material by itself is naturally fluorescent. It doesn't naturally cause, allow um, plus charge and minus charge to separate. Um, and if I wanted to characterize quite generally how molecular semiconductors are different to inorganic semiconductors like silicon, it is in the strength of the um, Coulomb attraction binding between um, plus and minus charges. Uh, molecular materials in general have relatively low dielectric constants. They will say have refractive indices of less than two. And what that means is that there's very little screening between plus and minus so that an excitation consisting of a plus and minus charge will remain coulombically bound by about 100 times more strongly um, than in gallium arsenide or silicon. So we have a binding energy of perhaps half an electron volt for a, an exciton. So to split it up, what is needed is a heterojunction. And of course, heterojunctions are what make photosynthesis work. And heterojunctions with molecular materials are much cheaper to make than they are with inorganic 3-5 semiconductors. You do not need an MBE machine to grow clean structures. All you need to do is mix together different materials. And if, because there are no, no broken bonds at interfaces, we just pile them up um, um, one on the other uh, and we can get a clean interface. Now what's illustrated here are two different forms of this polyparaphenylene ba um, vinylene backbone one with alkoxy side groups, which makes it soluble, and the other here with cyanide groups um, on, uh, attached to the vinylene carbons. The cyanide groups are electron withdrawing. What they've done is to pull down the energy of the um, lowest pi star conduction band state and the top of the valence band pi state with respect to the polymer without the cyanide groups. Now, if we can arrange that those two materials are next to one another, then the process that we want to make work is that we absorb a photon, which lifts an electron up from the uh, pi state to the pi star state in the um, left-hand polymer chain. And if that's all that would happen, it would remain as a bound state and re-radiate. But if this molecular excitation, the exciton, can uh, bump into the heterojunction, then the, there's um, a possibility that it will uh, transfer an electron from left to right because there's a lower lying energy state unfilled uh, on the right and the hole left behind uh, won't want to move too. So that's the process of getting charge separation uh, and the criterion for that to happen is that the offset of these band edge positions um, is larger than the Coulomb binding of electron and hole when the excitation is just sitting on one polymer chain or one molecule and the criterion comes out at about half an electron volt um, uh, energy difference. And it is possible to tune materials. This is a system which obviously works so that we can get efficient charge separation. Well, that doesn't instantly give us an efficient photovoltaic diode. And I should say that, that there's a huge level of interest at the moment in finding ways of using this sort of structure to make cheap, large area solar cells. Uh, the problem is that in order for it to work, every excitation, every photon absorbed in this, the bulk semiconductor has got to create an excitation which does a, uh, bumps into some heterojunction in order to charge separate before it um, gives up the ghost and emits a photon. Um, and the problem is that that is a rather short distance that it will travel, typically 10 nanometers. So you need perhaps 200 nanometers of thickness to absorb light, but if only the light that is absorbed within 10 nanometers of an abrupt heterojunction between one material and the next uh, is going to be uh, useful, then it will produce a low efficiency device. And of course, nature has found very elaborate structures um, to 
tackle that problem in photosynthesis with uh, these um, spectacular light harvesting antennae molecular systems that funnel exotons down to the reaction center, a much cruder approach which has been um, sorted out in many ways in the field is to arrange that we have a distributed um, area heterojunction within an absorbing film. So the ideal structure would be a sort of interfingered organization where we have fingers that are no more the dimension of the exciton diffusion range so that it doesn't matter where light's absorbed, it will create an excitation which finds the heterojunction, charge separates, and then we can pull the charges back to the collection electrodes uh, to, to make the photocell. One of the ways that you can form structures of this type uh, is actually just to take two polymers, and here obviously they're hole accepting and electron accepting polymers, and mix them up in the same solvent and spin down, just you know, paint down a film and pump the solvent out. And we make use of a well-known property that is um, something which is uh, in, in most of the time a nuisance, and that is that polymers generally won't mix. They have a low entropy of mixing and the enthalpy tends to cause them to phase separate. So we can start off with a common solution and then we can control the drying conditions and end up with this interfingered structure so that we can get um, the criteria we need for efficient collection of, um, of light uh, near heterojunctions. The results at the moment are interesting but not competitive. Uh, there's, uh, there's no reason why we won't do better, uh, but I'll show you some Cambridge-based examples. These are some solar cells actually a few years old uh, doing a rather non-exacting task, which is powering a little LCD um, clock. Um, and these are structures which um, they, they show relatively high quantum efficiencies for charge generation. I mean, this is an example. Well, the, the, the figure quoted here is 26%. That converts to a rather lower power conversion efficiency, uh, in this case about 2%. Um, but um, uh, that, that is sort of where the field um, well, has been moving from. I should if I wanted to pick up the best results in, in, in the world of uh, organic solar cells, uh, these are based on uh, the use of a polymer against a derivative of uh, Buckminster fullerene C60, which is a very good electron acceptor. And th there is uh, a lot of activity from a US-based startup, Kanaka, uh, who've made s substantial progress towards um, coating on a roll-to-roll -roll process the different components that make up these solar cells. Now, the efficiencies um, I mentioned are not high enough, uh, and one of the pieces of work we've been doing in Cambridge in the last uh, two or three years is trying to understand what actually limits efficiency. Uh, and the limiting step is actually close back to the uh, problem of Coulomb interactions, uh, poor screening. And it's the, the problem is actually screening of, ch of the charge-separated state we get across the heterojunction when we first photo-excite it. And uh, some particular material systems, which I, and the details don't matter so much, give us a clue as to what's going on. Um, and they're shown here. Um, this particular polymer, F8BT, has this benz thiodiazol unit in it, which is a strong electron acceptor. That, if you like, is the replacement for the cyano groups I showed you previously. And these polymers on the left, PFB and TFB, have a nitrogen with three fennels um, around, around the nitrogen that try... Uh, triphenyl amine is a good hole acceptor. But the, uh, what's interesting about th this combination is that when we photo excite, uh, we get something which appears to be charge transfer um, across the heterojunction, but there things get stuck. The electron and the hole are definitely um, not sitting on the same polymer chain, but they've de they're definitely still in a bound state. And what we've got is a, an excitation across the heterojunction, which in chemical language is probably called an exiplex. And the characteristics of it are that it's a lower energy state than if we just got the exciton on one chain or the other. So there's a redshift. We've also got an optical transition, which is across from one molecule or one polymer chain to another polymer chain across the heterojunction. And the matrix element for that optical transition is much weaker than if the transition were just on one molecule. So it's much slower. Uh, what is shown here um, are the luminescence spectra for the pure um, hole acceptor, the PFB here, which is a blue material. The peak emission is around 470 nanometers or thereabouts. 
The electron accepting polymer, FABT, is sort of yellow green. Uh, its um, um, emission is around 530 uh, nanometers, but mix them together and we get red emission uh, with a peak at about 630 nanometers. So th that red emission is this across the heterojunction transition. Now, in the time domain, what we see is a hundredfold slowing down of the emission. Typically, if you have an excitation just on one molecule, it, it has a radiative lifetime of a nanosecond, 10 to the minus 9 of a second. What we measure here is a radiative lifetime for this red emission. I mean, in this example, the, the, the actually measured time is 47 nanoseconds. One can work, out, work back that the radiative lifetime is about 100 nanoseconds. It's been slowed down. So we've got red shifting and slowing down. Uh, a very good characterization of the electron and hole across the heterojunction, but not able to escape one another. And accidentally, for these particular material systems, there's just enough overlap of wave function of electron and hole across the heterojunction that we can still see this radiative transition. So it's a really good signature of what actually is generically um, the, the, the issue in getting good charge separation. So um, what, how does this then play back on the problem of making a, a solar cell? Well, you might think that if we've managed to get the charge separation across the junction, uh, it wouldn't be that hard to then um, put a bit of electric field on and further pull them away from one another. And if you look casually at what's going on, um, one can see a very strong electric field quenching of this um, across the heterojunction um, red luminescence. So, the, so what we've done here is just put the sample, the polymer film, between two electrodes and then put a modulating voltage across it and look for a modulation in the luminescence. And what we see is that the luminescence, the, the black dots are the uh, full luminescence signal. The red line is the change in luminescence when the voltage goes on. We've quenched by 50% the luminescence. Uh, that quenching is associated with free charges, electrons and holes that do escape one another rather than, than being bound at the heterojunction. Now, in fact, uh, it, it's at a very early stage where the excitation, where we have a hot excitation at the heterojunction, that the branching between bound and charge separated occurs. Uh, it's um, not once the exaplex is settled. Um, so it's when we have, well, uh, the jargon here is a geminate polar on pair, where the presence of a DC field biases it towards free charges rather than this bound exaplex. And what we can see, uh, a way of seeing this very clearly, is that if we plot as a function of bias voltage, this is sort of reverse voltage across the diode, naught through to minus 10 volts, and we look at the photocurrent, which is the red line, uh, it goes in forward bias, we get charge injection, and the current takes off, that's not important. Uh, and then look at the blue line, which is this fractional quenching of the exaplex luminescence, the two lie on top of one another. So if we quench the luminescence, we get charge in the external circuit. Now, it turns out that irrespective of the morphology and the composition, this a completely identical overlay of this luminescence quenching versus um, photocurrent in the external circuit as we go into negative bias. It, very tantalizingly, if we uh, quantify it and plot photocurrent as internal quantum efficiency, that is, fraction of charge, percentage of a charge collected in the external circuit per photon absorbed in the film, um, and then use the same scale in percent for the for percentage quenching of the luminescence, they just lie on top of one another. The x-axis here is um, the, the different composition of the two polymers in the blend. We have a one-to-one -one correspondence, the same fractional quantum efficiency for charge collection as uh, quenching of luminescence. And that really, uh, that the one has to put a few caveats into the, uh, dis, uh, into the argument, but we have this ratio of one, and what that is showing is that uh, every time, if we don't do anything, if we don't have any external bias or internal bias set up by the open circuit voltage, uh, we end up with charges that are initially separated but then get stuck, and we need an, ex we need an external field to pull them apart, and we can see this one-to-one -one correspondence between either luminescence or charge in the external circuit. And that does indicate a number of directions to go in uh, to improve um, performance. I'm going to turn now to transistors because this takes us um, into the world of, perhaps more directly into the world of uh, nanostructures. Uh, transistors um, are relatively easy beasts to make. 
um, uh, they're very easy to make with organics. Uh, essentially, a field effect transistor is a structure where we have a, a gate, an insulator, a semiconductor, and then some electrodes on the top of the semiconductor. And if we put an electric field between the source and drain and the gate, and it works correctly, then the electric field ends up being established just within the insulator, which means that we've got sheets of induced charge. In this example, positive charge induced in the semiconductor, negative charge in the gate. And those positive charges sitting in valence band states are then capable of transporting a source drain current you know, parallel to the, uh, in the, in the plane of the interface. Uh, so that's the switching action. Now, of course, most of the Wells transistors use silicon as the semiconductor and silicon dioxide grown as a thermal oxide um, on the silicon. Changing both materials introduces all sorts of hazards, but remarkably, uh, it works quite well. So this is a paper we published in 2000 showing that we can make source, drain, and gate by inkjet printing a conducting polymer mixture. This, it has the acronym PDOT, PSS. It's a material composition sold as an anti-static um, paint. We can paint or spin coat semiconductor and insulator, and we can use all three material types from polymer sources and the transistors still work. Now, I have to say the first transistors we made uh, were pretty hopeless. Uh, that M should be a micron. They're, they're huge. That's a quarter of a millimeter, that space bar. The problem is that drops out of inkjet printers are actually relatively large. They, might like, they may be quite good for home photography, but compared with Pentiums, they're not much good at all. A drop size is about 20 microns, about the width of a human hair. So if you've got unconstrained drops landing on a substrate, the best you can do is perhaps about have about 100 microns separation between source and drain, and they, they're not very useful, but, they, but the characteristics, um, the transistor characteristics, are very good. Well, what we did by, in various ways was improve the geometry um, and improve stability, and we founded a company called Plastic Logic, which we thought was a great name for a company. We understand what it means, but philosophers are a bit perplexed. What is here is, if you like, the sort of sales pitch as to what can be done now. There is an organic polymer used in place of silicon. It has the figure of merit, the field effect mobility, for this particular example, is a factor of 10 down on amorphous silicon, so it's not great. But these are transistors working in moist air, so they don't need encapsulation and they were made at room temperature, which you can't do with silicon. Uh, and they have pretty good on-off ratios. It's a 10 to the 5, something like that. And they're good enough to be able to provide an active matrix backplane of transistors to switch a display. And the display that we've gone for is an electronic paper display. Uh, we're making use of a display effect that has been pushed very hard by a company in the US in Boston called E-Ink, and that's electrophoresis, where you t they've produced a foil with capsules, liquid-containing capsules with black and white pigment, and one or the other is pulled up to the top surface, depending on the applied voltage. Now, to turn that into a useful... So it, has the, it looks like ink on black ink on white paper, or more or less. Very appealing to look at, and it's flexible. In order to turn it into a useful display, it needs a matrix of transistors to set the voltage right at every point on the display. And what we're doing is making that matrix with our plastic transistors. There is a significant challenge to get layer to layer uh, organized. We have to do in-plane patterning, and we have to be able to get registration from one layer to the next, and those are significant challenges. But when we've done that, we can then laminate our transistors printed on, well, Coke bottle substrate, a polyethylene terephthalate, uh, laminate that with the e-ink foil, and then we have a paper-like display, which is, uh, uh, that's a, a, not a mock-up, that is a display. Now, it turns out the biggest challenge in this is that the, the problem is that we can't use mask alignment. We have to use innovative patterning techniques for the higher level patterning steps, because the substrate itself is not sufficiently geometrically defined or rigid that a mask would line up from one one mask process to the next. Uh, the, the, the distortion of a fraction of a micron over a, a, a length of tens of centimeters is very hard to avoid in a sheet of plastic, particularly if you've had to cycle it in temperature, as you 
would have had to have done if you'd used silicon as a semiconductor. So what has been done here is to use patterning techniques such as inkjet printing, where it's possible to do on-the-fly correction in real time so that the printing or patterning of higher-level metallization, say, is done in registration with the lower-lying pattern, even in the presence of mechanical distortion. It's about an A5 size display we've got at the moment, and it's being switched as it's, um, as it's being bent. So the current plans with this are to set up a manufacturing plant, um, which is um, being set up in Dresden. And in two years' time, if you want to part with vast sums of money, you'll be able to get an e-book or an e-reader uh, where um, you, you won't break it um, when you sit on it, and you won't need a magnesium alloy case for it. And this is a technique uh, which we've called self-aligned printing, and the idea is that we want to put down a source and drain close to one another, but we, won't, but we don't want to have to use uh, photolithography to pattern it. So what we've done here is to print down a first drop, which may well be from a water-based solution, the P.PSS, and it'll have a hydrophilic surface. Now we can do some chemical modification to it to make it hydrophobic, and in brute force would be a carbon tetrafluoride plasma. More subtly, we can put a surfactant into the a polymer mix when we inkjet print it and the surfactant will end up on the top surface. And then when the second drop is then printed, if that is now repelled by a now a hydrophobic surface and we've now got two drops which are separated by this surface interaction. It's not very different from the interactions which control cell walls in biological tissue and they're about the same dimension. So I'll show you a little video. What you can see there is a first set of drops that has been printed to form a line, and then what is being done is to print a second set of series of drops, and they're just repelled away from the first track. And remarkably, they don't short. They're, they're pretty reliably insulating. Um, and then if we make transistors, but the inferred um, channel length for these structures is about 60 nanometers. So 60 nanometers is current Pentium technology, uh, we've done that, if you like, without any brute force lithography, and we can do that over a large area. So one final little trick, um, which is, um, or little surprise, um, is back to the structure of the field effect transistor, and you may have noticed that I chose to put a negative gate voltage on the device, so we induce positive charges in the organic semiconductor. And in the literature, that's almost universal what is uh, found. I mean, in principle, one would expect we could simply reverse the gate voltage and induce negative charges if we have a positive, in the semiconductor if we have a positive gate voltage. The problem is that, in general, they don't work. Uh, the reason is, actually, uh, because a lot of people have used silicon dioxide as the dielectric, and the hydroxyl groups on the silicon dioxide turn out to be susceptible to electrochemical reduction to form um, o, Si O minus states, rather than allowing injection of electrons into the semiconductor valence the conduction band. And if you go to the right dielectric, and those turn out to be organic dielectrics. Uh, in this case here, this, this is the, uh, an example of a thermally cross-linkable um, polymer um, a BCB, benzocyclobutene. Then it turns out that we can get um, N-type behavior just as easily as P-type behavior. Uh, and this is um, an example of an N-type behavior in a polymer which in the literature has been resolutely P-type only. So it's a sort of oxymoron. And we do find similar mobilities for electrons and holes. So it does mean that we can make um, the same device to run either P-type or N-type if we choose the right source and drain materials. And it makes possible the demonstration of, a, of um, a sort of dream that had one or two false starts elsewhere in the community, and that is the light-emitting transistor. And the idea is that if we hold the gate voltage midway, say, between the source and the drain voltage, uh, to one side we're going to induce positive charges at the dielectric semiconductor interface, and to the other side, uh, negative charges. And they're both drifting towards one another, and where electron meets hole, well, we should get formation of an exciton and light emission. And I'll take you through to the one that works best, and I'm afraid, I don't know whether it's possible to turn any lights down, um, but what we have here are 20 micron separation between source and drain interfingered electrodes. What we're doing is sweeping the gate voltage, or, uh, causing the, the electrons and holes. Now they're now moving across the channel. They're traveling 20 microns across. So they were initially recombining close to one electrode. They're now recombining close to the other electrode. 
uh, and as the gate voltage goes further over, we're pulling away from ambipolar to unipolar, um, and the light goes away. But we can see um, the, the channel of light, the line of light where electron meets hole within the channel of the transistor. So with that little light show, I'll put up a summary. Uh, and the summary, for me, this is, is, this is practical nanotechnology. This is, if you like, functionality bottled up within a single molecule, or in our case, polymer chain, allied with novel ways of manufacturing, because in the end, it's manufacturing that makes the difference. That's what causes uh, industries to happen. One has to be a great optimist and reckon that what I've told you is in, immeasurably crude and that far more sophisticated control of structure is, is absolutely possible and that will take the field further into the future. Thank you.